so it's now in the record mode and let's begin my name is alexander arlovsky i'm a freelancer out of nuremberg and you're watching in the introduction about history of java enterprise if you have any further questions, you have my contact information, like my email, my website, and even mobile application. One, another slide about me. I provide different kind of services, and there is a software development, creating automated uh, software unit tests, uh, requirements engineering for the client, I, 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 advising of the companies, uh, helping people to get hired in other companies, and quite a lot of different other consulting services which I provide. So if you're interested, you just can contact me with the following, on the following slide present information. So let's speak about Java Enterprise. The history behind Java Enterprise. You see, uh, I have written here, stuff in German language so and I'm doing the presentation in English because I prefer to use kind of major language English is a major language in the IT field anyway so to get much broader people from all of the sites of the world I think it's better to explain stuff in English so basically here you have dates of of the Java enterprise is actually which version belongs to each year. And one main thing about Java enterprise is the following that to the version 5, 1.5, it was pretty difficult uh, to develop in Java enterprise environment. I'm kind of lucky not experienced that and i was brought to the attention my attention was brought to the java enterprise when it was at, at the version 1.7 and things uh, how it's all came about as far as i know uh, sun microsystems and ibm get together and they discuss it how in the future it would, uh, would look like the enterprise solution. So, and they develop with other companies in the meetings um, some standards, and then they kind of agree on those standards, and then it's obvious from the standards was derived, derived the Java enterprise as solution. Later in the history, Sun Microsystem was bought by Oracle, uh, Oracle of itself um, took some time to adjust to the Java enterprise, but uh, they decided uh, at some point of time they decided to go further and they uh, given away uh, Java enterprise to the, to the Eclipse Foundation with the goal to be more open. So kind of pretty nice gesture from Oracle to be even better. And what about Java Enterprise? In my opinion, most important parts of a Java Enterprise in any way, are, there are three frameworks, Enterprise Java Beans, Java Server Faces, Java Persistence API. And let's just look at the each of the framework which I have spoke about. First of all, Enterprise Java Beans. Um, the main reason behind uh, Enterprise Java Beans is provide a la layer of soft software layer which allow you to do some business, heavy business uh, calculations. Like, I don't know, calculating exchange rates calculating amounts of items in your in your database things which are related to business some business heavy uh, calculations uh, this data will be then forwarded to the java server faces this is another framework 
which is responsible for representing uh, HTML stuff. So basically, uh, you can imagine that this framework is responsible for generating of HTML content, content and then uh, providing this content to the clients. Basically, a client calls some page and then he sees the, the view, the result, the page itself. Then client type some stuff into page, like I don't know, first name, last name, and such and such. And then this data will be gathered and then evaluated through the Java server faces and then forwarded to the EGB. And what about Java Persistence API? Java Persistence API, is, this is a, another framework which completely responsibility to have connection to the database. So you don't need to write on SQL queries. You use a simple uh, Java code in order to persist your data into the database. And some people prefer not to use Java Persistence API. Uh, some people use only Java Persistence API. In my point of view, some po many times uh, you need to ask uh, yourself or somebody responsible in the company, how many times you want to switch your database and who will be responsible for managing actual database uh, transactions. So basically, are you still have in your company a database administrator or you have DevOps guys which are responsible with working with your database. But in the Java enterprise heavy world, you have this layer which allow you kind of simplify the work with your database. And I say, depending on the case which you have in your company, it makes sense to use Java Persistence API. Um, in some cases, there are kind of anti-pattern to use Java Persistence API. So it should all be always depend on your case. But you need to know Java Persistence API uh, in order to be truly independent of the database vendor. So things like that. And now I just uh, present you a pretty simplified view how exactly um, Java enterprise application can look like. So basically you have your application server where you have deployed your enterprise java enterprise application this java enterprise application can consist of java server faces enterprise java beans java persistence api and to simplify this even more uh, jpa can be outside of your application application can be actually a separate application but uh, it's all about Java classes, which have, which have some annotations. As I said earlier, uh, previously in the past, it was needed to create XML files to have kind of uh, mappings for your Java, Java Persistence API to be, in order to be able to access database. But nowadays, you can write things like annotations and which allow you to simplify the work. But anyway, some people say we don't need AGB. I can understand that. You can actually do only JSF and JPA. This is possible. But if you think uh, things about past, how it was done in the past, this is pretty, uh, pretty clear picture how it was done in the past. So you configure your applications server for the database then you configure your GPA to be able to access the layer of the database in your application server. And then when the user connect to, to your uh, page, call your domain name, then application server goes to the list of the deployed application. 
it looks like uh, okay for this port which I have configured in the application server. I need to call this application. It calls this application first. It calls JSF. JSF. Uh, if it was connected in such a way how I represent here on the slide, it it asks AGP for data. Uh, it can be, I don't know, list of items from the database. HB ask JPA this list, and then JPA through the layer of the application server ask database. If database not available, it's a problem, but should be, I think, let's think about happy path, and database is available, so database sends data requested data from the jpa and then jpa will just forward data back to the agb and agb forward data back to the jsf and jsf uh, then generates the page which then user see as a result of all of the process i don't need to go even further with that you can it can be pretty hard with other stuff and another notable and very important frameworks which are part of GEE and I forgot to mention GEE consists of like 25 different frameworks which are kind of a, of a standard for the Java enterprise application. Uh, it, it mustn't be complete so if you have idea how many frameworks do you need for your Java EE just do some common sense don't use all of them use only such a frame frameworks which make sense for you so here's the list of the frameworks which are too important for the java enterprise uh, java messaging services uh, java mail context and dependency injection of course you need that to inject into your classes uh, another class instances then you have all technology java server pages you need that if you have one 1.5 or 1.6 version of java enterprise and then you have frameworks with working with xml like for example soap soap technology and then you have restful so you basically create a project which kind of in the way it kind of works like a page but you get not HTML you get um, JSON format output and kind of the same is Java Jax VS but it's like using XML for exchanging the data so you send a, an XML and you got a response of the XML uh, most times what I personally see in the clients projects uh, uh, a lot of JAX RS and a lot of still a lot of JAX VS and of course me messaging services not quite a lot but it can happen so if you still learning uh, Java Enterprise I would actually advise you first learn JSP then then switch to CDI and then learn other related frameworks but major ones it's EGB, JSF and JPA so first you learn AGB, JSF, JPA and then you look up of the requirements of your company or the company you where you want to be hired and then you learn another framework for that kind of reason. So Another important thing to say to run a Java Enterprise uh, application, you need an application server, which can be nowadays Payara, a Glassfish application server, a WebLogic, Oracle WebLogic server, a Red Hat Wildfly application server, or the old one JBoss. So for, for the stuff related with the Java version, it's pretty important to say that probably should be okay with running stuff on Payara if you need a commercial support or just use as free product. 
uh, if you're pretty serious and you can use, of course, WebLogic, or if you have kind of open source project, you can just use Glassfish, Payara, or Wildfire. There exist a lot of different serv servers, but I found myself most uh, uh, like gravitated to those kind of servers which I have presented to you today. And one interesting thing which I observe nowadays, we in 2020, there are still a lot of uh, projects, client projects, which still use Java 7 or even Java 6 for particularly. JBoss application server basically would run on Java 7. And I don't think that it's possible uh, to run JBoss on newer versions. Maybe I'm wrong, I'm not sure. But I say you need to test on newer versions. And best advice, make sure that you can run stuff on the Glassfish or Payara. Why? Because a Glassfish was uh, developed in the to the standard of Java Enterprise. So it's completely uh, full 100% standardized application server. So it's completely, I will say, it's pretty sure that if, it, if you develop a standard Java Enterprise application, it should be possible to run without any problems in Glassfish. And the same goes to Payara. Uh, yeah, and what about newer Java versions? You need to make sure that all of your frameworks are supported by the new Java versions. And in, basically, if you want to test it, you need a test environment. Don't, don't go to the production and deploy new Java version and you need to test first your environment and then only then you deploy it into the production. So think about it pretty, pretty clearly and use common sense. So what is in store for the future of the Java Enterprise Edition? Well, after the Oracle decided to give it away to the Eclipse Foundation, nowadays Eclipse Foundation is responsible for the future development. This is actually an uh, open source project and Eclipse Foundation have members which are paying money to be, to be a member of this group, but you actually can commit code. So you don't need to pay them money to commit the code. But if you want to be on the board, which decide which feature should be in the next Java Jakarta EE version, then possibly it should be the case that you need to pay the money to do that. But I mean, it makes only sense for me. So what about Jakarta EE? Another thing to think about. Um, I do not observe it on the day-to-day -day business uh, stuff, uh, but I see that it's probably I'm pretty confident to say that uh, Java EE8 applications would run on the Jakarta EE application servers. Um, in the future, it, it probably would be possible that some of the old standards will be dropped because community decided not to have it in the new Jakarta EE version. It can happen. So if you interested to run your product production great uh, java enterprise applications and you interested into jakarta ee you need to make sure that you tested your application on the jakarta ee compatible server so my best advice go to the jakarta ee look around get hold of the application server and test your application and if you get some problems, just uh, raise an issue at their uh, code versioning system at Jakarta and hopefully they would able to help you or you have some ideas. Maybe, it, maybe for some clients make no such 
big deal if some of the frameworks dropped. But I say if you want to have security patches, performance increase, uh, you need pretty, it's pretty obvious that in 2020 you need to make sure that you're using the uh, stable latest version of the Java Enterprise application server if you still wish to have to work with Java e further. So now we switch to the another stuff about history. Uh, Oracle RDF, pretty interesting derivative of the Java Enterprise. I will say it, it's there are some clients which still use it. Uh, I have heard rumors that uh, Oracle IDF would have support till 2025. So it's rumors, I repeat again. But uh, in my own experience, it was pretty fast development. Some small uh, issues with the uh, deployment to the Payara but it is possible not only to run it on the WebLogic server, but rather to run it in the Payara, completely uh, full profile compatible Java EE version. And what is about, what's special about Oracle IDF? Oracle IDF have additional layer, which is not, not uh, Java EE uh, standard. Uh, you have normally, JSF, uh, then you have your EGB or JPA, but with Oracle you have uh, between your business logic and the JSF you have additional layer, it's a ADF layer, which allow you to use ADF elements on your page. Basically it was done to have better experience developing web applications or even actually developing um, desktop ap applications. So it's a kind of uh, additional stuff which Oracle added. Um, it, it takes time to get completely picture how it works. It's possible, uh, it takes only time. It was pretty nice experience, I must say. Uh, I was, was pretty fast with development of UI elements to create forms and then figure it out how the forms can pass the data to the business logic. And I just can only advise you if you wish to have the JEE version from Oracle, you can use Oracle ADF, but think that uh, probably support of this framework would be uh, deprecated in some foreseeable future. This is kind of rumors. I repeat, this is only rumors. But it is possible that Oracle can deprecate it someday. So I probably, my best advice would be like, I don't know if you want to have a kind of small applications with basic features and don't spend too much time with JSF, it should be the best possible solution for you. And now, uh, this is a kind of um, kind of generalization of what I have said about Oracle ADF framework. And one major thing which I forgot to mention, but here you see on the slide, uh, if you use, if you want to develop your application, I advise to use Oracle IDE J Developer. It takes some time uh, to understand how it uh, wires all of those Java classes into the Java Enterprise project, and but it then allow you to be pretty fast in what are you actually doing. So just try it out, my best advice. And now we at the point where pretty modern framework, which was developed out of the frustration with the Java EE version 1.4 and 1.5, uh, some Java Enterprise uh, community did not accept it, the standard Oracle uh, Java stuff, and they separated from that and they created own framework, which is now this have Spring, named, the name of this framework is Spring, 
uh, <laughs> I, here I will drop some hello to the Josh Long, who likes uh, Spring a lot. And Spring pretty, uh, I will say, oh, not so new, but it was new to, to, to the time where I learned Spring. Now this is kind of one of the major Java enterprise standards. It used a lot uh, in cloud-based solutions and a lot of start startups using that. And major difference between the JEE and the Spring, uh, Spring does not need any application server. At the end of the day, in Spring you have your uh, jar file, which you can execute in the Java environment, and then you have comp complete application. And you see from the history, it's like it was uh, what I observe personally is the small framework uh, got bigger. So it's you can actually find uh, familiar frameworks which you saw in Java E. They exist familiar in Spring. And Spring basically one of the projects which I've worked from time to time with clients, uh, it's a Spring Boot. It consists of uh, following architecture. And you see uh, that it's kind of familiar to the Java enterprise architecture. Uh, you can have a JPA, things like that. You can have a presentation layer. It can be uh, it's actually a different framework to handle the user data. And the controller is responsible uh, for all of the requests which you, your server gets from the outside. So basically it's like user want to open the web page and then he access the controller. So nothing much to say about. Let's just go to the slides and I'll try to explain my best. So, uh, what you see is this actually how Spring MVC, which is part of the Spring Boot, handles the user input. You write your uh, front-end controllers in the Spring Boot, which then delegates the data to the controller. And then the controller responds with the appropriate HTML page and manipulate the data in this page, which the user later see. Spring Data, it's a framework almost similar, almost like JPA. It is abstraction layer for the persistence of your database. There you can access entities, which represent your uh, schemas in your database. And kind of familiar to the Java Persistence API. So if you're interested, you just read it, read it, read it, read it, and then you understand how it works. But basically, the main reason about Spring Data just not to write your own SQL. If you want, if you have requirements to write SQL, probably you don't need Spring Data because why? Why should why should, why should bother? Uh, so let me kind of summarize what about Spring. Spring does not need own application server. It's kind of cloud native framework. Uh, cloud native means you've written your Spring Boot application and deploy into the cloud and then it's accessible from the cloud without any additional work, configuring server and things like that. And my, in my personal experience, uh, Spring Boot, um, if it's done pretty, I would say, hastily made it way, it's kind of difficult to test. But uh, actually, if it's done right, it's actually easy to test. So it depends on the skills of the developers who work with this framework. Uh, it's very loved by the Java community, as same goes to the 
actually to the Java enterprise. But uh, the tendency of the young developers actually goes to the Spring Boot. And I sure can understand that. Uh, me personally, I am kind of neutral. I can use Spring Boot. I can use Java Enterprise. So I'm kind of client dependent in such a way. But my best advice, just try it out and choose the best tool for your work, which you can get quickly your job done. That should be, that should make sense. And now here I want to show you my small Spring Boot project. Let me show it like that. Talk is cheap, show, show the code. So now I need to stop sharing. And I would try to share my, where is my application? Uh, if it allowed me to, let me just quickly try to check it out. Um, I hope I can maybe let me just quickly try it out. Ah, I hope you can see that. So I have my. Uh, this is kind of interesting stuff. This is a standard Spring Tool Suite, which is Eclipse-based uh, IDE for Spring Boot, Spring projects, actually. And there I have my project. It consists uh, many parts. One is uh, for the testing, so I can test my controllers, I can test services, I can test my models here. And then I have resources, uh, basically pages, which then be presented to the user. And then I have here main logic models to store the data because I don't use database in my project. I, I use in memory to store my uh, data. And basically here, typical main class to start the application. So let me just quickly do that. Okay, just ignore, ignore that. And so basically here I mentioned things which need to be wired, my controllers for the user requests, security config services, which I have in my class because I have data which stored in the memory. And then I need just to run my Spring Boot application. And then you probably hope I hopefully I hope that you see what actually happening. The application prepared to be launched. And basically consists of many stuff. One is a spring framework. Then other other part is my my classes which I have in the project. And now you see how it start the application and it says uh, started application it, it's hosted on the 8080 and if i want to access it i just need to do it like so and you see the page so basically uh, this project is about to have a page where people who are looking for new job can in organized way store their data. And like, I don't know, somebody wants to just be registered. Let me just quickly type some data, John Smith, then mail, I don't know, user at hotmail. Point com. I have all things with the validation done, like I don't know, years ago. Um, so street name, test street, street number two, country name, I don't know, USA, mail, tester, 
zero zero one, and then captcha still need to be implemented to this point of time. So let me just quickly get hold of it. Tester zero zero one, submit registration. There you have things like let me just quickly store the name. And then I just need to store the password. Okay, both things are stored. And let's try to log in. Log in. So what I have, and password generated automatically. And basically it's kind of typical what you see on the net. You registered yourself to the page and then you receive your special password and log in. And then the user is logged in and he's, he can go to the account office. The project is not completely done. You can pretty clearly see it, but it's give you an impression how a typical Spring Boot uh, application would look like. It's kind of monolithic, you can actually split it out if you wish. It's all about then a software architecture, but things can be done pretty easy. And it's all, av uh, all av available on the GitHub. And I can actually recommend you just get my hold of my project, play with it. If you think you can help with my project, just submit the the, the issue and then if it's good I can add it to, to the main trunk to my, of my project. So this is all about my code. Let's switch to about my project. And so basically what I did show you is that this is Spring Boot itself is interesting way how to do Java Enterprise because at the end of the story you have only one jar so now i show you a maven this is a kind of description what to use in in the project and then it will be packaged in the release when the project is built so here just you need to go through this but in any way this is kind of which modern people do it. Java Enterprise, most times what I see in comparison to the Spring Boot, uh, most times the legacy uh, projects, there are pretty, pretty, pretty few new greenfield projects with Java Enterprise. But as I said earlier, for me personally, it doesn't matter. I can work with both frameworks. But if you kind of new to the Java enterprise and want to be more efficient, then probably you should use Spring Boot because it's lightweight. It's easy to get some stuff running. But it can be changed from time because you have now Jakarta and Jakarta increasingly can get even better than Spring Boot. It depends then on the community. And let me just go to my slide. Where is my slides? Okay. Okay, slides. So let's just quickly okay this is kind of oops goes out of the hand uh, okay now I just need to switch to the chat and let's look it at the chat. Chat. Uh, 
Okay, let's do it again. Oh, I see the chat window. Okay. So, one last slide from, from me. Notable mention. So, here you see, uh, first, uh, I provide you the link to my uh, understanding of the ecosystem of the Java platform. There you can actually look it up and get more or less good view on about it. Then another pretty important person in the Java community is Adam Bean because he is one of the, I will say, senior people who worked with a, a lot of Java enterprise projects and he uh, kind of gathered a lot of data. He has a lot of interesting uh, courses about Java enterprise, which I can only recommend. Just try it out. Then there's Sebastian, Sebastian Deschner, IBM lead Java developer, which two Java champion like Adam Bean. And he actually has more architectural view on the Java enterprise. Then there's another guy like Reza Raman, hopefully I spell it right. And he's understanding, uh, he is and more about Java in the cloud. So if you're interested to run your Java applications in, in the cloud in Microsoft Azure, you can actually go to his uh, channel, YouTube channel, and then get information about how to run Java and Azure cloud. And then there is pretty interesting independent trainer, Torben Janssen, which is German too. He is a specialist in the area of Java persistence API. So you can learn from him all, the, all things about how to make sure that your JPA is most efficient. So this is kind of another pretty important uh, person in this Java enterprise ecosystem. And there are some books. Mm, these books, it's pretty important to know what you learn, you need to apply. Because if you don't apply your knowledge, you can quickly forget it and it's pretty heavy stuff. So books which I mentioned for Java E Spring Boot, uh, pretty on, on hand. So you take it, you read it, you build your project and then goes through different, quite, different kind of patterns. And then you have Oracle ADF, which I suppose I need to mention too. But this Oracle Dev, it's important <coughs> first to work with Java EE and then go back to Oracle ADF. Mm, yeah, it takes time to get know to know how Oracle ADF works, but it's just just a question of time, not about kind of special skills. So basically, pattern is try out Java EE standard Java EE starting from version 1.8. Then try out Spring Boot. If you're not happy, just try Oracle ADF. And then decide which of the frameworks is best suit for you for the, your future project. Time, time prognosis for learning all of the stuff. Six months for the Java EE. Six months for learning Spring Boot. Uh, then you have, you can actually learn in four months the Oracle ADF after you have learned Java EE and Spring Boot. So around one year of continuous learning of all of the stuff, you'll be pretty uh, proficient with this kind of frameworks and experience. So are there any questions right now? And I have, I don't see any questions at my chat. And I suppose questions will arise. Once again, if you have interest to work with me, you can visit my site. 
or just give drop some message and thank you for your time and i hope you learn something new and till then thank you all bye bye